Okay, so um, I would like to open up the floor for questions for anybody in the room, but before we do that, let me soften the ground a little bit with some questions recorded by other classes. This question is from Michelle Granados. She's an 11 a.m. student. Um, and one of the nice things about you visiting now is that we're mask optional now. So this question is related to that. As a rise in COVID-19 cases came within the city of Springfield, do you still believe, sir, based on a statement about health that you made, that Missourians should be empowered to make the best decisions possible for themselves when it comes to their health? Yes, I do. I think that health decisions are extremely personal. And um, if there's a, is there, is there a follow-up to that question? No. Okay, so I'll just expand on that just a little bit. So when it comes to issues of masking, for example, I have no problem with people who want to wear a mask. If you want to do that, I think that's great. Um, I don't think that it's my job as a politician to tell everyone to wear a mask. I don't think that I know better than you do how to run your individual life. So I think that's a decision that's, that's best left to the individual. And um, I'll throw this out there when it comes to vaccines too, because I know that's been a hot topic and maybe something that uh, is on your list of questions. And, and the same would be true of, of COVID vaccines. I'm not opposed to those at all. I know you have a few folks on my side of the aisle who are like absolutely just opposed to the concept of the COVID vaccine. I'm not opposed to those at all. Um, I've received it, my family has. Earlier this summer, I actually worked with um, Representative Fogel and a couple other uh, to host a vaccine clinic for those who wanted to come out and get it uh, or wanted to find out information. And that was my purpose for it. Um, I don't think that government should mandate vaccines for the same reason I don't think that they should mandate masks because each individual needs to weigh that for themselves and decide after looking at all the risks and benefits if you think that's the right decision for you. Uh, related to that, here's a question from Ileana Waldron, an online student. She says this question is for Alex Riley. On the SB 51 bill, on the protections for various organizations from COVID-19 related lawsuits. Word for word, she asks, when voting yes on this bill, why did you vote in favor of the organizations rather than the individuals affected by this bill? So what SB 51 did is it said that if you have a lawsuit where someone is filing suit against some sort of entity, let's just say it's Walmart. If you're filing suit against Walmart claiming that because of something Walmart did, you contracted COVID-19. That this, the standard to prove that suit would be higher than your typical negligence lawsuits. So that's um, that's all that 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 bill did, and that's there are a number of reasons for that. Obviously, it's just going to be extremely um, hard to show that. You know, it was Walmart that caused you to get COVID versus any of the other dozen places you may have been that same day. Um, so, so the concern there was if there weren't enhanced protections in place that people could potentially run rampant with filing frivolous lawsuits against all of our, uh, our businesses, our hospitals, um, colleges, could be anything. Um, so the, the intent of that bill was to still allow um, good lawsuits to go forward. We're not just cutting off people's ability to uh, sue for negligence, but to hopefully prevent frivolous lawsuits from being filed. We actually have uh, some news today. Uh, the President of the United States has selected a candidate to replace the outgoing Stephen Breyer for the Supreme Court. We have a question from Crystal Gregory, an online student, a pretty timely question actually. There's actually several parts of this, so forgive me. When voting on the disapproval of the Supreme Court expansion, sir, why did you feel like it was necessary to vote to prohibit the president from growing the number of seats on the Supreme Court? What effect do you feel like this would have on Missouri? Do you feel like the nine seat Supreme Court is sustainable? The student writes, the Constitution is meant to be changeable and adaptable. Wouldn't it make sense that the branches given birth by the Constitution be the same? Yeah, so just to put a little perspective on what that was. So she's talking about a, a resolution that we in the legislature passed last year that has no binding effect on the federal government. Basically, it was just a, um, frankly, it was a political statement 
that we in the Missouri House disapprove of any attempts to increase the size of the court just to pack the court. And I think that that goes, um, that would be, that would be a uh, consistent, sorry about that. That would be a uh, consistent view that I would have um, regardless of which uh, party was in power in Washington, D.C. or which ideology had the majority on the Supreme Court. I, I don't think that it's appropriate to just expand the number of individuals, whether it's the court, the legislature, or any sort of uh, body that is in power, um, just because you don't like the, the current makeup of that body, you don't like the decisions that are being made. Um, I, I don't think that's an appropriate um, way to handle that. I, I think the way you change the makeup of, of those bodies, whether the courts are a little bit different, um, but the, the way to change the makeup of the body is for you to present arguments about why your views are better than the alternative and um, to let the, the voters ultimately decide. And then that would have, when you're looking at the courts, um, since it's when you're looking at federal courts specifically, when you're uh, addressing who goes on those courts, the Senate has to confirm those nominees. So um, the, if you're looking at elected representatives, those individuals should follow more or less uh, follow the wishes of the population they serve, and you would have individuals who represent uh, their communities on the courts, uh, ideally. So we got a lot of questions on a few topics. One of them was on abortion slash reproductive rights. Benjamin Seeger, a Tuesday, Thursday student, writes, if a vote for making abortion illegal came up, how would you vote? Uh, I would vote to make it illegal. Um, I would also note that that would be the law in Missouri anyway. So based on a, a pro-life bill that was passed before I entered the legislature, um, if Roe versus Wade was overturned, um, if it gets overturned this summer, as some are expecting, then there's a provision in Missouri law that says that abortion would automatically become illegal in this state. So that's already the law here. Um, I don't know that that would be something I would ultimately have the opportunity to vote on because that law was in place, but I would vote to make it illegal here. Uh, I will throw it to the room after this question. Anybody have a question? Like I said, feel free to, you know, Alec, uh, uh, sir, he's good for it, although uh, ultimately you get the final decision uh, on whatever questions you answer. No question is off limits. Okay, sounds that. great. Let's do it. Uh, let's go for one last question, though, from Caitlin Russell, an online student. You're standing in a community college right now. She asks, should there be free tuition for community colleges in Missouri? You know, that's an interesting question. And I am not inherently philosophically opposed to, community, to free community college. Uh, I'm a huge fan of community college. I, I think that the, the return on investment that you all get for going to community college, as well as the return on investment that the state gets for investing in community college is, uh, is enormous. It's great. Um, my only hesitation would be on the budgetary side, is if there is money in the budget to sustain that kind of funding. Um, so my concern really would be if we started doing it in a good, in a good uh, revenue year, like we're in right now, um, if what happens in the future when there inevitably will be bad revenue years, and you have to decide, okay, what programs are we going to cut? Uh, it's, it would be a problematic thing probably oh, to, to get something started and then cut it off. So that's really my, my main concern as far as um, funding community college across the board. But I'm not inherently opposed to that idea. I, I'm, I'm open to it. All right, I'd like to go ahead and open the floor for any questions somebody might have for the representative. Uh, anybody have any questions right off the bat? Yeah. Can I ask why you would make uh, abortion illegal? Yeah, uh, it's because I, I personally believe that life begins at conception. And I think that even if there is um, question about that, that we should err on the side of life. So 
the, the only real exception I would consider would be a life of the mother exception because then you're looking at two lives and trying to say, okay, which life is more important. Um, that would be something as a policy maker that I don't believe that it would necessarily be my job to say one life is more important than the other. But when we're talking about um, human life in, in, in general terms, I think that we should have laws in place to protect those lives and to say we're not going to, uh, as a society, allow the termination of life like that. What about for like incest or rape? So that's a tougher one. And for me, um, I, I personally don't think that two wrongs make a, make a right. So uh, I, I, I have some concerns with saying um, even though there's been this unquestionably awful situation occur, that that still uh, warrants the, the taking of a life. Other questions for Representative Riley on the same topic or different topics? Let me ask you real quick about, um, this is a, we're, we're right now we're actually talking about the legislative branch. Uh, we have a question from Erin Reed on 11 a.m. student. She asks, would you describe yourself as a trustee or as a delegate in your voting behavior? A trustee, in case you haven't, don't remember your PLS 101 education, a trustee votes uh, how they see fit regardless of how their constituents may feel. A delegate is somebody who votes in line with how their population, how their constituents feel on any given topic. You know, I, I think it would be probably to be fully transparent, some combination of both. So like I, like I told you at the beginning, um, when, I, when I vote, it is based on um, the, the facts and data that are presented to me at the time. So uh, that's why, frankly, I, I probably have kind of a strange voting record than that I do vote with the Democrats on some things and, uh, and, and against my Republican colleagues on, on a, a lot more, frankly, than um, than probably a lot of people think. And it's because if someone comes to me with an argument and says, like, here's the facts that back this up, uh, then I'm going to vote based on those facts and not based on um, emotion or pure ideology, things of that nature. Other questions for Representative Riley? Right now, sir, um, this is a question from Gabriel Alexander from the 11 a.m. Representative Fogel voted no for House Bill 554, which allowed companies to charge sales tax for online shopping. Quoting the student here, most people would definitely agree that they don't like having to pay sales taxes. Was there a specific reason as to why you voted yes for this bill to be passed? I'm trying, so I think that's the Wayfair bill last year. Is that correct? House Bill 550. Okay, so I, I think what they're talking, what that is talking about um, is a bill that we passed last year that's called um, the, the Wayfair Tax. And basically the idea is that uh, if you're selling online under the law as it was currently, we didn't have a structure in place to in Missouri to collect sales taxes on um, on those purchases that were made online. We were one of the last states in the country that uh, didn't have that in place. I think maybe Florida was the only other one last year and I think they fixed it as well. But the issue there is I'm, I'm certainly no fan of, of taxes as you might expect. Um, but the issue with that is when you're taxing, when you're taxing in-state purchases at your brick and mortar stores that are physically located in-state, but you're not taxing uh, purchases made online that could be from out-of-state retailers, you're putting your in-state retailers at a disadvantage. You're, you're, as a government, picking winners and losers and actually favoring out-of-state entities that are selling into the state at the disadvantage of your individuals who are, who are currently in the state. So if that's what that bill is talking about, I think based on the, the context of it, I forgot the number, um, that's why I voted yes on that bill, is because I thought it was uh, fundamentally unfair to have certain taxes in place that uh, on our in-state individuals that out-of-state people would not necessarily have to, uh, have to pay those same taxes. This is a question from Madeline Eady, a Tuesday, Thursday student. 
Um, great question. She asks, can you elaborate more on SB 86, legislation regarding school districts being able to use public funds for supporting or opposing candidates? Specifically, why people would vote no on the matter? Aren't schools supposed to teach kids to make their own political decisions? Wouldn't arguing for or against candidates influence their decisions? I don't remember that specific. I think bill. it's an assent. Right now. No, okay. I said she she listed it as as SB. Yeah. Basic, so. so that's not something that I have seen yet. I don't believe if it did come out come across uh, the house last year. I certainly don't remember it. But that sounds like um, standing here now without having a chance to do a deep dive. Uh, I, I would agree with that student. Um, there was uh, we also got a lot of questions about the prescription drug monitoring program. So I'll ask you about it before you answer. Please explain what on earth it is for people that might not be aware of it. In the months that bill, uh, SB 63, a bill establishing a statewide prescription drug monitoring program has been passed, have drug problems decreased, such as overdose, addiction, et cetera? What kind of prescription medications are a problem? Okay, so the prescription drug monitoring program, briefly, is a database that uh, medical providers would have the opportunity, and I think are now required, to enter anytime someone goes into their physician requesting a certain type of uh, drug, that that would get entered into a database that would be accessible by um, essentially any medical provider, any medical facility in the state, and, and there may be some um, data sharing agreements with other states as well. And the idea with that was to try and prevent um, individuals from going from physician to physician to get drugs to feed their addiction is, is the idea. Um, I voted no on that bill when it passed last year uh, because I had some concerns with, um, number one, who would be managing that prescription database. Um, it would be a, a, some kind of quasi-governmental entity and I, I'm not really comfortable with uh, government having that detailed information on each individual's prescriptions and health issues and things like that. So I had some real concerns about that. Um, when you look across the country at the other states that have had uh, the PDMPs is the, is the acronym for it, I, I, I was not convinced that there was data that showed a meaningful decline in drug overdoses um, when you looked at what was in what was happening before a PDMP was implemented in the state versus after a PDMP was implemented in the state. So because I couldn't see something that showed me that this is really going to work and have the desired outcome, those privacy concerns that I had outweighed the, the arguable uh, public benefit side, so I voted no on it. As far as what we've seen in the state since PDMP was implemented, uh, I suspect that it hasn't been in place long enough to really get a good idea to see to show if it's working or not. So this actually leads really easily into our next question. Do we have a question? Oh, yes, please, please, let's do um, it. So you said for someone who comes in a request for a specific drug. Now is that with anybody who's getting prescribed, let's say you have like a knee surgery and you're getting prescribed these medications, uh, will that go on that as well? My understanding is yes. Okay. Which was, which was one of my concerns. Right. Okay. I had knee surgery and yeah, they opioided me up for yeah. sure. Um, that well, leads I, I wanted one more point on that. Yeah. So uh, the, the idea is to address mostly opioid uh, addiction, but the way the bill was written, it's the, the, the types of drugs that would be entered into the database go much beyond opioid. So I thought it was way too broad in that respect as well. Other questions for Representative Riley? Well, this actually topic feeds into the next question really well. It's more ideological in nature. Um, you're a Republican. Republicans tend to be more conservative. And yet Republicans in mass voted for the drug prescription program. We have these drug pre uh, prescription monitoring programs in, I think, every state in America, conservative and liberal. So let me ask you about that. This is from Avon Brown, an online student. A major viewpoint of Republicans is that the government should have less control over the country while the people possess more power. 
What aspects of government do you believe the government should continue to manage, and what aspects should the government no longer manage with such power? Yeah, that's a, an excellent question. I so I, I think that there are a few main buckets that I, I am comfortable with the government having some role in. So certainly infrastructure, I think that makes a lot of sense. I'm not really aware of any other entity in existence which could replace the government's role in managing infrastructure. Um, so when you're, and, and I would um, even, don't, not just talk about like roads and bridges, but um, more uh, broadly than that, uh, broadband and internet as well. I don't have a real issue with government investing to try and expand uh, internet access into certain areas. In fact, that's one of the things that we're working on right now with some of um, the funds that are currently available in the state. We'll be investing about $400 million this year in expanding internet access across the state in areas, especially um, in rural areas, and then even in some of the more urban areas that don't have good internet access. Because you can't really function fully in our, our national economy right now without good internet access. Um, so that's certainly an area that I'm comfortable with uh, government being involved in. I, I'm also, I don't have a, a real issue as well with um, uh, education, uh, government funding, schools, and things of that nature. I think that makes sense that we've been doing that in this country really since, the, since we were uh, created. Um, don't have an issue with that. I do think that we get far too involved in um, business regulation, to be honest. So that's one of the areas where I'm especially active in, in, uh, in working, is rolling back a lot of regulation where government is keep coming in and telling businesses that we know better than you how to operate your individual business. And the problem is um, a lot of the folks in government have never managed a business. They've never worked in a business. And I, I don't know how you can say that I, who've never done this thing, know better than you who does this thing every day how to do your job. So uh, one of the things that I'm constantly working on is trying to find those types of regulations that really just don't make any sense. They're not actually protecting the public. They're not doing any of the things that good regulations are supposed to do and rolling those back. I could go a long time on this answer. So we can continue or... Well, I actually have a follow-up on something you mentioned. All right, let's let's education. Um, we have a school board election coming up. Yeah. The governor just gave a state of the state address. And in the state of the state address, he said, let's increase teacher pay, yeah. public schools, public school teacher yeah. pay in Missouri. Now, Missouri uh, is 50th, 50th in, in public school teacher pay. Um, now, the, the governor said they want to increase teacher pay, but they also said he needs cooperation and help from local school districts. If we make you emperor of Missouri, what does that look like to you? All right. So I have no issue with increasing teacher pay. I would like to really change up our pace, our teacher pay structure in the state because I, I don't think it's any, it makes any sense. So right now, our teacher pay structure basically only looks at a couple of factors in deciding how much you're gonna get paid as a teacher. It looks at how long you've been a teacher and it looks at your uh, level of education. It doesn't really look at much beyond that, like, how good at the job are you? Uh, are you someone who um, every day after teaching your students, you then go home and spend another six or eight hours that day getting ready for your next class? And that causes me no end of frustration because I don't think that we as a state um, do a good job of really rewarding our teachers who go above and beyond uh, to pour into the lives of their students. And if if you made me emperor of the day and I could just change that, I would, I would, uh, I, I don't have any issue with having sort of a, a, a set minimum for teachers. That's not a problem for me. But what I would like to see is when we're, when we're looking at the overall compensation structure, let's not just look at how long someone has been there or what degree they have. Let's look at uh, how good are they at their job. It, and I've talked to principals about this because I've had some people express some frustration with me when I um, said these things in the past about, well, how, how are you going to measure who's a good teacher, who's not a good teacher? Are you just going to look at test scores and things like that? And obviously, that you can't just look at test scores. But I also know that if I were to walk into any, any public school in this city and ask the principal, 
who are your best teachers, they would all be able to give me the names of who their best teachers are. So there's a way to do it um, where you can where you can look at who are really your teachers that are performing above and beyond. And I think that we should reward those people uh, for what they're doing. Sir, maybe our, oh, no, go. She has a question. What is your opinion on Missouri's response to sexual assault survivors? Do you believe it's a good or a bad response? And if, and would your opinion change if someone close to you was affected by sexual violence? You know, that's a, a, a good question and really not something that has come before me in the legislature yet. Um, so I, I, I would be curious, and you don't have to t tell me about it um, right now, but if, if the state is not uh, doing an adequate job I would like to know that, and if uh, anyone in the class has thoughts on what we could do better, um, I would certainly like to know that as well, because just to be fully honest, that's not something that's really come before me yet. Would you be comfortable staying a minute or two? Absolutely. Um, let, maybe maybe our last question, maybe our last question, that was a really good one. Um, which one did I want to ask you about? Oh, okay, so um, this is a question from Van Thang. He said in February of 2021, you voted in favor of prohibiting enforcement of federal national gun laws. He says, will your stance change in the future? I ask, why vote that way? Yeah, so to clarify, um, the bill he's talking about is something called the Second Amendment Preservation Act. And what it, there are some things it does and some things it doesn't do. It does not prohibit the enforcement of federal gun laws. What it does say is that the federal government cannot compel the state to use the state's resources to enforce their federal gun laws. So there's a little bit of a distinction there. The federal government through its agents, so if you're talking about um, some, some sort of federal gun crime, um, the, the FBI could still enforce the law, the ATF could still enforce the law. Uh, it, it's not saying that those laws are not unenforceable here. It's saying that you can't compel the state to use its resources to enforce the laws. And the concern there would be more uh, with uh, laws that infringe on uh, individuals' rights to protect themselves and to bear arms. Um, it's, it's not really addressing um, your, typical, your typical criminal acts where we also have state laws in place that address those types of things uh, and that our state entities routinely uh, take care of. And any other thoughts? Yeah. Um, we, we are down to a minute. Uh, how do you feel about the ATF not having a computer database to trace guns? That's an interesting For question. Um, so I, I would say, so I won't be able to personally have any sort of impact on that since I serve at the state level and that would yeah. be a federal um, level thing. I, I, I don't think that there should be some sort of database in place that would trace every type of firearm um, for a lot of the same reasons that I have concerns with that PDMP program where I just don't like um, government databases tracking a lot of individuals' private things, frankly. Um, if, if we're talking about guns that have been involved in crimes, and that's probably a separate issue where I would uh, I would be more sympathetic to that. Okay, uh, great questions for everybody. Uh, round of applause, real quick. <laughs> I, I, I had uh, I had a couple of homework ideas, but I was anticipating half the class showing up today because almost everybody showed up today. Let's go homeworkless. Uh, so I will see you. Uh, Monday, right? We have class Monday. So I'll see you Monday. Um, don't worry about homework. Maybe could you raise your hand in the back corner? Where she is sitting, please turn in your Riley papers. If you want to say hey to Representative, feel free to do so. Thanks for having me. Really yeah. appreciate the questions. Yeah. Appreciate it.